You guys know about vampires? You know, vampires have no reflections in a mirror. There's this idea that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror. And what I've always thought isn't that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror. It's that if you want to make a human being into a monster, deny them, at the cultural level, any reflection of themselves. And growing up, I felt like a monster in some ways. I didn't see myself reflected at all. I was like, yo, is something wrong with me? That the whole society seems to think that people like me don't exist? The Rainbow Theatre Project is committed to being the premier theater for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community in our nation's capital by presenting plays and musicals that reflect the unique experiences, interests, and history of the LGBTQ community. The current show is written by uh, Kevin Michael West, and it's called The Doma Diaries, and it's uh, a history play about three couples who were trying to get married, and it follows their lives uh, over many years, actually. Doma is over. It's been struck down. So I definitely did get the comment that this is history, it's done, it's over now. I think it's really important to remember the history behind things and remember the people who did suffer and did fight. It's very recent history. It's still a battle that we still have to fight and it's still just like, yes, we won, but there's still more battles to do. There's still fighting to be done. There's still inequality in this world that needs to be fought. One of those battles that the Rainbow Theatre Project is fighting is a lack of representation in the media that we consume every day. Take television, for example. Of the 895 regular characters expected to appear on primetime scripted broadcast programming in 2017, 43, or 4.8%, were identified as LGBTQ according to the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation organization. In movies, LGBTQ characters were in 17.5% of major studio releases in 2015. In both major movie releases and cable shows, the majority of LGBT characters were gay men, while in streaming shows, lesbians made up the majority. Want to marry me instead? The vast majority of LGBT characters across all platforms are white. For example, in movies, white characters made up 72.3% of LGBT characters. This lack of representation can take a toll on the psyche of LGBT individuals, especially youth. As for bi representation, there's just not a lot. And when they are represented, it's usually either very stereotypical or it's not like explicitly said that they're bi. They're just like confused or they don't want to label themselves. Sometimes you get bombarded with this one image of like a very feminine gay guy. And that's fine because like that's definitely a part of gay culture and we embrace, I embrace that. But um, it's annoying if that's all you see. It becomes a thing where uh, it feels more like voyeuristic towards straight audiences than something that's actually meant to appeal to LGBT people. As far as bisexual characters, not as much. It's not as spotlighted on as I wish it would. It makes you almost question yourself and you think, well, Maybe that's just like how I am. Like maybe, like if so, this this person is clearly bi, but they don't really say it. Well, then maybe like that's not really like a thing. It's like when the character is just that, like stereotypical gay thing. That's annoying. But if if it's if it's more than that, I get like surprised. I'm like, and it's just it's super exciting for me because I can be like, oh my god, my people. It just brought me to tears just sort of seeing that experience on screen and seeing the emotions that he's experiencing that like I could relate to. It feels like, hey, there's other people out there like me, and like they they have like complex personalities and like lives and they're not just like one stereotype. When I watch a film and a character that is realistic and believable is identified as queer, uh, it definitely stands out to me because that's not something that you see very frequently and the same goes for theatre. I hear this time and again after we have a performance, somebody will come up and say, my god that's my story or I grew up in a small town and I never felt I could say who I was and and that's why I think this kind of art is really, really important. As things get published, as uh, plays, movies, music, um, 
it's very important to keep that going um, through the arts we're able to um, give a voice to those who may not have pride in general is about visibility and making sure that even if you know the heteronormative family down the street isn't affected by things that they're still aware that their neighbor is not living the same life that they are in a personal sense this show means a lot because this is the first time as a gay man I can play a gay man on stage and that's empowering in a way since I'm so used to playing heterosexual characters. Shows like this are extremely important. Um, there's just too much hate in the world still and we need to make sure that everybody has an equal chance to live their life to the fullest. I think throughout history um, theater and arts has been critical in social change. Considering the election that just happened, I think gay theater now more than ever. Chocolate is really a luxury. If you understand where it came from and how it's made, it really improves your appreciation for it. It's really amazing how your psychology um, determines how much you enjoy something. My name's Colin Hartman, and I'm one of the owners, co-founder of Harper Macaw which is where we are right now in this chocolate factory. I started it with my wife almost exactly a year ago. We launched. Um, however, this whole process from coming up with, you know, the name of our company and finding this space and sourcing our equipment and traveling down to Brazil to the rainforest to, to source cocoa beans and stuff like that has been a several year process. I would consider it to be not necessarily just a small family business, but more of like a, a startup. We're trying to change the way that a, that a supply chain functions and really raise the bar in terms of the quality of the product. I do not have a background at all in chocolate. It's actually my wife who does. So Brazil, like I mentioned, where she's from, is a cacao producing country. Um, basically anywhere in the tropics that you've got a you know, rainforest style environment, you can grow cacao. We only work with agroforestry farms because that's, that's naturally what that environment should be like. It's naturally how cacao should grow. And so we have a very, very strict uh, guideline that we use for determining whether or not we want to work with a, an agroforestry plot. So we're looking at the environmental conditions. So are they planting in accordance with ecologically sound agroforestry principles? Do they have um, you know, a lot of different native tall trees that are providing shade to the cacao? Does it look like there's a lot of biodiversity in terms of plants and animals? Um, also, there's socioeconomic factors that we look for, like is it operated by the owner, does the owner basically manage it and has other kind of seasonal people that come in and do the harvesting, how much do they get paid, where are they living. We try to get a very, very close, detailed look at what's going on at these farms, both environmentally, socially, and economically as well. The one piece that sometimes gets left behind are the parts that are helpless against human activity, which is nature a lot of times. Um, you know, I think that like ultimately nature and, and earth will be here after we're gone, um, but human beings have shown that we have a tremendous um, propensity to cause dramatic effects on nature and the environment. What happened specifically in Brazil in the 80s and 90s was there was this fungal infestation that wiped out the cacao production and the farmers really were only planting cacao maybe some other you know, natural rainforest trees, but the cacao was their only revenue stream, so they had to cut everything down and be, become basically cattle ranchers. So they, were, you know, they had these, these pastures in the middle of what should be rainforest, and so a huge amount of deforestation was caused because of that, which is part of the reason why our, our like, environmental um, impact model exists is because cacao is part of the problem, and, and so we're trying to make it the solution. So in the packaging, we wanted to have this contrast between um, this tropical rainforest, kind of like bright, flashy uh, element to it that is actually arranged in a kaleidoscopic manner, and then put a endangered species that is native to the areas that we source from there. Um, just because I think it's, this is the, the, the real um, 
you know, they're, they're the inhabitants of these habitats and these environments. And so it's just a way for us to communicate that like, this chocolate was not made to extract from this environment, but to support it. And so by purchasing a chocolate bar, you individually are reforesting about 20 to 40 square feet of land. And I think that's something that's pretty incredible when you can attach the idea of buying a consumer product or something that's like even a more awesome version of a consumer product like chocolate, that directly reforests land right in an area where cacao, the main ingredient in the chocolate, had previously caused a huge amount of deforestation due to just improper farming methods by farmers and then also just this disease. Um, it's a pretty powerful thing. So the type of homework I get varies from class to class, but this year I'm taking like Spanish literature and English literature, so I get a lot of reading. Um, and then I get math homework, that, which is just like practicing my skills. I get homework from every subject mainly, but the most abundant homework usually comes from, you know, history classes and English classes. Anyone who's been in a classroom knows homework is a major component of education. But so many students struggle and stress over their homework, raising the question, how can it be worth it? So if they don't know any information at all, then reading and taking notes in the textbook is going to help them have some prior knowledge, or maybe even better, by doing that reading and taking notes, whatever kind they want, then when they come into class, then they can ask more informed questions. For the on-level class, the most effective homework is often just things we've already covered pretty well, and it's just extra practice to reinforce what we've been doing. Single period AP Chemistry, we just don't have a lot of time, and they're spending a lot of time just actually doing practice problems and trying to figure it out. And they're gonna run into a lot of roadblocks, and they're gonna have to do some of their own learning on their own. If I'm feeding them all the, the next steps, that's not always gonna be helpful. Sure, it is. It feels nice when you like you can follow everything that's going al along and you do it relatively quickly. It's like, oh yeah, so that is what we're gonna do next. But if that happens all the time, then you don't learn how to struggle. And learning how to struggle productively is one of the most important things that we learn. Homework serves as an extension of the classroom, allowing students to practice skills independently and allowing teachers to cover content they otherwise wouldn't have time to. These are nice ideals, but in reality, they aren't always effective. For whatever reason, it is, it seems unreasonable to, uh, to be confident that every student is going to come in having read the assigned textbook sections for that day, and that makes it really hard to conduct class. I think homework can be students' friend, but time management is a big, a big um, challenge, and it's... It's very sad to me when I see students who are so tired because they have so much homework in all of their classes. What is the point of homework? Or anything we do in school, the point is to get that information, to get that knowledge across to the students. Right? So my AP students, they walk in and they have a wide range of abilities and prior knowledge before they step into my room. And so homework can be good if it's pushing them and you're learning more or you're reviewing concepts you need but there's diminishing returns. I don't like the abundance of busy work some homework gives. Teachers should know whether the homework they're giving is useful or not based on what they've taught in class. Students can and should utilize homework to benefit their education, but bearing that weight alone is overwhelming. Teachers need to ensure the homework they assign is purposeful and makes the best use of students' time. I think that you have to manage the load really carefully, but in the first couple of years of doing something, it's really hard to get it right every time. Uh, I have not always gotten it right, and when I don't get it right, it means that I have to be, you know, I have to be agreeable about extending deadlines where necessary or cutting out parts of the problem. And I am also trying to get better at assigning work that is educationally efficient, which is what is the least amount of work I can assign that allows you, number one, to produce something substantive and real that felt worthwhile, and number two, to learn the things that I need you to learn. Homework is a long-standing tradition in education, but it's also one of the most stressful parts of the school experience. 
To minimize stress and maximize learning, students need to be considerate of the purpose of homework, and teachers need to be cognizant of their specific classroom's needs. So teachers, do your homework, and the students will follow suit. I heard about National Novel Writing Month, and I was intrigued by the idea of just like writing a lot in a month. So I just made up a character, and I had some other ideas that I brought in together into a world, and then I just started writing. I went to Santa Cruz with Santa Cruz, California with my family and I was looking at how beautiful it was and it looked like a place out of a movie and I thought this would be a great place to set a story. It started out as a one month project. The idea was that I was just going to try to get the 50,000 words down and I didn't know if I could do that or not. And then after I didn't finish, it extended with like interruptions because of some school year things became busy. My book is called Mango Passion and the Male Species. One of the big themes of my book is about forgiveness, but overall the book is definitely a quirky love story. It is about the importance of friendship and what it is like to be a teenager who is falling in love. My book is called Fractures in a Dream. My book's about a woman who gets caught up in a rebellion in this world called Essentia that I made. There was some stuff I couldn't drop from, like I haven't ever wanted to open a smoothie shop and, um, and sort of the stuff with the main character, um, Guy, like her love interest, was sort of all just fabricated from my mind because I haven't gone and had a summer romance in Santa Cruz. But a lot of that came from other books but also just experiences that I know my, my family and friends have had. And so it was taking my experience and then adding the experience of others. And once I had that, it was such a great foundation that I could sort of let it build just from where my characters were going. Actually, my main character was, because she's a mom of two kids, I guess she ended up being based a lot on my mother. Some of the challenges she goes through psychologically were based on what I've heard from my mom about her childhood and growing up. And some of the issues she struggled with. The way it works is, it's an alphabetical language, so each symbol corresponds to a sound, which also corresponds to a meaning. Because in English, a lot of words, but not all words, they have a root and then like some suffix to change the meaning, right? So I was like, what if there was a language where everything was like that? And so you add V for verb, and then you add different markings for tense as well. I was trying to edit it, and it wasn't really working because I was very attached to the story, and I didn't want to change it. Um, but I was taking Ms. Platinsky's creative writing class and also her AP Lane class, and so I started to get close with her, and for one of the assignments in creative writing, I turned in a chapter from my book. And she wrote on it, this is really interesting, I'd love to read more. And then I told her that there actually was more because it was part of my novel. And she said, oh, that's really cool, this sounds like a great story. I handed the manuscript over to her, and she read it actually over this past summer. And I met with her at the end of the summer, and she told me all of these things that I could fix, and they were absolutely fantastic edits that I could never have come up with on my own, because you can't look that objectively at your own work. It just it, it isn't possible. And so having a set of English teacher eyes and a person who was outside of my friend group who could really give me good edits was super helpful and has improved my book drastically even though I'm not done editing it. I plotted out every single chapter of my book before starting which helped me a lot as I wrote because I knew what was going to happen and then I could focus more on the character development which comes a little more naturally to me. Inspiration comes from like you have to just write you have to force yourself to just get down those words every single day and as you do that you'll get more immersed in the world. You have to put yourself emotionally into whatever you're writing. Old Town Tacoma Park is a charming neighborhood just outside DC. It is home to a number of wonderful places to eat. Soon, Old Town will be welcoming a new restaurant into its community, Tacoma Beverage Company. The man behind this new hotspot is Chris Brown, 
formerly a Montgomery County public school teacher and coach. He left teaching this year to open his cafe. The Silver Lens team went to visit Mr. Brown at his new business to find out more Owner about this promising addition to Old Town General Manager Tacoma of Park. Tacoma Bevco, you guys come on in. So here's the space, obviously we're uh, early in construction, um, but we're going to have a bar down the left side that's going to have coffee and tea, and then uh, 10 taps for craft beer and craft cocktails with, uh, with wine and things like that. And then down the, the right side of the restaurant here, we're going to have all the tables and chairs. Uh, people can come in and hang out and do work and, and drink coffee and tea and use the Wi-Fi. If you come down here, we've got two bathrooms. Nice and spacious. And then we'll have a small kitchen back here. So, uh, so the kitchen will be back here. We're going to have a, a dish area um, for all the dirty dishes. This is going to be um, the cold area prep station. This is going to be the warm area prep station. We'll have a couple ovens, a produce sink, hand washing sink. Uh, so it's, it'll be a tight kitchen, but it'll be enough to crank out some, some pretty often awesome cafe food. Uh, so, during the summers I work with my cousin at a coffee shop down in Virginia and it's, uh, I just had a lot of fun working with people and making kind of craft coffee drinks and, and uh, my cousin is, has competed in the National Barista Championships, he's, a, he's an awesome, awesome coffee guy. And so we just had the idea to, uh, to open our own shop and we were looking at locations for a couple years and when this spot opened up we decided we had to jump on it, um, Tacoma Park is awesome. How's it going? <laughs> Tacoma Park is awesome, and we just we love the area, we love the people, and uh, and there's a need for for this concept in this area. So I decided to leave teaching and uh, and try out this venture. Opening a restaurant is no small task. It requires a lot of hard work and planning to ensure a great product. Luckily, Mr. Brown and his team have navigated the process expertly and have been well rewarded for their efforts. This process has been crazy fast and from, uh, from talking to investors and talking to our, our property manager and, and all that, this is, this is not a typical speed. It usually takes a lot longer. Um, but when we found the location, we realized that we kind of had to make a move because it, it was a location that we really wanted and, and we didn't have any, everything else wasn't lined up quite yet. So um, once we got our business, we formed our business plan super quick. It was actually right at the beginning of the summer. Um, that came together really well and then we actually had an investor that loved the concept and kind of jumped on board really quickly and usually that process takes a lot longer. Um, and then he just kind of go, go jump through all the hoops. We had to get our liquor license. Um, it took a couple months but we got it and then uh, all the permitting for building, the plan, the design, um, all that just takes, takes a lot of time. So we started out uh, maybe a year and a half ago just going around and, and researching all over from Northern Virginia to Capitol Hill, all over DC, all over Maryland and, um, and we always wanted to do a coffee focused cafe and, uh, and so we have a, our beer director is a good friend of ours and he would come along with us and he'd have suggestions for beer lists and things like that and so over time we just developed this really cool concept that was, that was coffee, beer um, and cocktail focused. In addition to drinks, Tacoma Bevco also plans to offer a small menu so that patrons can dine in the comfort of Old Town Tacoma Park. A couple of the breakfast sandwiches are, are rocking. There's a, there's a pork belly uh, breakfast sandwich with like a, um, a pickled slaw that's going to go on there. And there's a couple uh, vegetarian options like a really a, a super healthy lunch bowl uh, that I think is going to be awesome. Some stick to your ribs options as well. There's a couple of grilled cheese sandwiches that are going to be mind blowing. and. And then we have the, our evening menu still in the works, so we'll see what comes with that. Under Mr. Brown's determined care, Tacoma Beverage Company is set to become a highlight of the Tacoma restaurant scene. So the plan is, and, uh, and of course this, this may change as inspections come through and permits keep coming through, but the plan is a February 6th open date. With a lovely atmosphere, great food, and delicious drinks for all ages, it is sure to be a fantastic addition to the community. If you're looking for a place to work or a bite to eat, you'll love the new cafe right in the heart of Tacoma Park.
Hello and welcome back to Suburban Bakery. My name is Amy and today I'll be showing you how to make chocolate mint crinkle cookies. To start, you'll need two cups of flour, one cup of cocoa powder, two teaspoons of baking powder, a half teaspoon of salt, two cups of sugar, a half cup of oil, two teaspoons of vanilla, four eggs, one bag of mint chocolates, and a cup of powdered sugar. You'll also need a medium bowl, a large bowl, a wooden spoon, a whisk, and a baking sheet. We'll start by whisking together the flour, cocoa, baking powder, and salt in a medium bowl. You might be tempted to mix the sugar in with the rest of the dry ingredients, but it'll be a lot harder to mix the wet and dry ingredients together if you do that, so please don't. Next, in a large bowl, whisk together the sugar, oil, eggs, and vanilla. Add the flour mixture and stir until you have a soft dough. Once you have your dough, cover the top of the bowl with plastic wrap and refrigerate for at least two hours. While your dough is chilling, lay the chocolates out on a plate and put them in the freezer. We'll come back to them later. When your dough is nearly ready to be used, preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. You either need to grease your pan or line it with parchment paper, and then you're ready to go. To make a crinkle cookie, form a small ball of dough about the size of a half tablespoon and roll it in powdered sugar. Place your cookies on a baking sheet an appropriate distance apart and bake for 11 to 13 minutes. They're ready to take out when they're cracked and look cakey as opposed to doughy. As soon as you remove the cookies from the oven, take the chocolates out of the freezer and place one in the center of each cookie. When you've done this for every cookie on your sheet, place the sheet in the freezer until the chocolate can hold its shape and is no longer shiny. Once you take them out of the freezer, you should let them cool the rest of the way. Or, if you're like me, you can eat them all immediately in one sitting. Enjoy! See you next time on Suburban Bakery.